Wake turbulence, also known as wake up vortices, could be thought of as the disruption of air left behind once an aircraft has passed through the area. It's important to understand uh, what phases of flight or what aircraft configurations may cause the greatest wake turbulence or wingtip vortices because of the dangers associated to taking off and landing behind larger aircraft. Now in order for us to understand what wingtip vortices are, we really have to understand the two different types of drag. And the first type of drag would be a parasite drag. And the second type of drag would be induced drag. And if we were going to graph these two, this would be our speed. And we'll say 0, 60 knots, and 120 knots. And this would be our drag. Parasite drag is anything that's creating drag caused by the aircraft uh, pushing through the air. So for example, anything exposed to the oncoming air is creating parasite drag. That could be anything from the antennas to the wings to the landing gear. Anything exposed to that oncoming air would create parasite drag. Now the thing that's important to note about parasite drag is that it increases four times with your increase at airspeed. So parasite increases four times the rate of your airspeed increase. Therefore, if you increased your airspeed by 10%, you just increased your parasite drag by 40%. So if we were to gra uh, graph parasite drag, it may look something like this. Now, induced drag is actually backwards. The induced drag becomes worse and worse the slower we go. So if we were to in uh, graph induced drag, it may look something like this. And wherever these two meet, they call that your LD max, which is your lift drag max ratio. It's basically your best glide speed. So your best glide speed is the point where you have the least amount of parasite drag and the least amount of induced drag. That means that if you go any faster, your parasite drag would increase and you would go down faster. If you go any slower than that, your induced drag would increase and then you would go down faster. So holding your best glide speed is very important if you had an emergency situation. Now, what is induced drag? It's a little difficult concept to understand, but it has to do with um, the positive air pressure underneath the wing wanting to meet the negative air pressure above the wing to equalize itself. Because remember, in, in the world, everything strives to uh, become more uniform or equalized. And when we're flying straight and level, we have a negative pressure above the wing, and we have a positive pressure ab uh, beneath the wing. And that positive pressure wants to get to the negative pressure. Well, it can't do it in front of the wing because we're moving forward. And it can't really do it behind the wing, so it's easiest for that airflow, that positive air underneath the wing, to slip off the wingtip and then come back around like this. So off of both wingtips, we have this circular motion. It's kind of a down, up, out, well, so it's like down, out, up, and back down again motion. And as the aircraft moves forward through the air, what, it, what happens is it ends up creating a downdraft behind the wing. And it is this downdraft that is creating our induced drag. <clears throat> if we're, you know, don't have much of, we don't have a very large angle of attack, then we're going to have more small wingtip vortices. But if we increase our angle of attack, if we increase our angle of attack, then you're, it's almost as if you're collecting air molecules under the wing. And the difference between the positive pressure and the negative pressure, that difference becomes greater. So the desire of the positive pressure will become greater. So therefore, we get worse and worse wingtip vortices and worse and worse downwash behind the wing whenever we have the aircraft pitched up, especially if we're slow and have power, which would be during takeoff and landing phases. Now, if we looked at the, uh, the wind that passes underneath the wing, it would go something like this. 
And the lift vector, I'm going to get rid of this here for a second. The lift vector always acts perpendicular to this wind, the relative wind. But when we have these wing tip vortices pushing this air down, then it actually bends the air like this. So what we really end up with is a bent airflow like this because the wingtip vortices and that downwash behind the wing. And it just so happens that the lift vector always acts perpendicular to that relative wind. So if we bend this relative wind down, then it bends your lift vector backwards because I still have to have that 90 degree angle. So if we're trying to go forward and up, and I have something pulling me backwards, that backwards pull is my induced drag. So a couple of things we need to realize here is when the aircraft is slow and collecting those air molecules underneath the wing, it's going to have greater and greater wingtip vortices. The other thing we want to bring up is ground effect. And if I had a way to reduce those or eliminate those wingtip vortices, then I could fly the airplane at a slower airspeed because I would have less drag. So if we flew the aircraft very, very close to the ground, this would be a profile view of a runway, and you're coming in for landing, and throughout this, this period of landing, you have those wingtip vortices coming off your wings, but once you get very, very close to the runway, and the books say half a wingspan width. So if here's our whole wingspan, they're saying half a wingspan width. If we are that close to the runway, then we disrupt these airflow patterns around the airplane. So once we come down into ground effect, then the wingtip vortices are reduced because the, the ground is in the way of this wing, these wingtip vortices. <clears throat> so if we eliminate those wingtip vortices, we would, in effect, reduce our induced drag, and the lift would maybe be right here. So we can fly in ground effect at a slower airspeed than we could just normally. And if you look at your airspeed indicator, for example, and you have the green arc here, yellow and red line, and then you have your white arc, and we know the airplane will typically stall at the bottom of the green arc in clean configuration, and it will typically stall at the bottom of the white arc in landing configuration. But if we're in ground effect, it's possible that that aircraft may not stall till that speed, you know, something below the bottom of those two arcs. Um, so we can use this to our advantage sometimes. Like, for example, uh, you'll soon learn how to do a soft field takeoff, where we take off in a um, grass strip. And the object is to get the aircraft airborne quickly, and then we can ride in ground effect why we are reducing our induced drag until we build up enough airspeed and then we can leave the airport area or the runway area. Um, but uh, ground effect could also be a problem for us if we came in too fast. If you came in too fast for your landing and you got a ground effect, the aircraft will float and float and float and float and it's possible you could overrun the end of the runway. Um, so if you're coming in uh, too fast or too high, it would be a lot smarter to slow the aircraft down and descend and then continue on your descent and land. You wouldn't want to come in too fast because you're going to float and possibly overrun the runway. Um, ground effect could also be a hazard on takeoff. If you were uh, too heavy or perhaps too tail heavy, the aircraft would have the tendency to premature rotate. Well, if you premature rotate the aircraft on your takeoff, it usually will come off the ground. But the problem is, as soon as you come up out of ground effect, then the airplane will want to settle, probably firmly, back into the, the uh, runway there. Okay, so we understand parasite drag increases at four times the rate of your airspeed increase, and induced drag becomes worse and worse the slower you go, especially with a high angle of attack, especially with power. And now we want to look at how could we avoid these wingtip vortices if a large aircraft was landing in front of us. Now wingtip vortices tend to have a downward motion and they will dissipate after about two minutes. So if we looked at the aircraft that has the wingtip vortices, 
Remember that it is a kind of down, out, and back up swirly motion, and this swirly motion will descend from the aircraft usually at about 500 feet per minute and last about two minutes. So you could expect that disturbance of airflow anywhere behind and below that aircraft. Now, if, the, if it's a very windy day, then often the wingtip vortices will be disrupted a lot sooner than that. When air is very, very still, those wingtip vortices tend to stay tightly wound and uh, stay in place, you know, still descending and uh, last about two minutes, but they tend to, to linger longer if the air is very still. Um, now, this would be the, uh, the potential hazards for taking off and landing behind a large aircraft. If you were coming in to land behind a large aircraft and the, the flight path of the large aircraft was something like this, then what you would want to do is remember that the wingtip vortices are kind of descending and uh, falling down. Well, they're descending and, and spreading out a little bit behind that aircraft. So if the aircraft landed here, for example, then you would want your aiming point to, or your flight path to stay above theirs and you would want to touch down behind, or I'm sorry, you would want to touch down in front of their landing spot. So if you saw an aircraft land right here, then you would want to stay above their flight path and intend to touch down right there. And that would keep you away from their wingtip vortices. Now, um, if you took off behind the aircraft, let's say that an aircraft took off, went down the runway, and took off about right here, and then you were gonna, you were clear to take off behind that aircraft. <clears throat> so the aircraft went down the runway and rotated and took off right there. What you would want to do is to make sure that you could go down the runway and rotate and climb above their flight path because the wingtip vortices from this aircraft would be descending and sprawling out. And you may say, well, how could I outclimb, or how could I have a greater uh, climb angle than, say, a 737? Well, you have to remember that even though that aircraft is climbing fast, it's also going out horizontally fast, too. And they also use a lot more runway than you would, so you may rotate back here and climb, whereas they've used a great deal of runway. So it's very, you know, it's not that difficult to stay uh, above a dis departing aircraft's flight path. Now, where it would be the greatest danger with these wingtip vortices is remember that the wingtip vortices, if this aircraft had come into land, for example, uh, let's say that they landed right here, that the whole time they're airborne, the wingtip vortices are going out like this. And the worst situation would be if you had a very light quarterly tailwind. So let's say the wind is off the tail, the right rear, at about three knots. Well, and you may say, well, I'm not, I don't intend on landing with a tailwind, I intend on landing with a headwind. But don't be surprised, especially at large airports, that the traffic that has been using runway one, while the wind has shifted around ever so slightly, will continue to use runway one, because especially at a rush hour at an airport, um, they're not going to move 19 or 20 aircraft around in the other direction if the wind is just so light and not really going to affect their landing distance. So what happens in this scenario is these wingtip vortices will be blown right onto the approach course, which would definitely create a hazard for you in a lighter aircraft. Now, how do we know how far to stay away from these aircraft? If you're coming, if you're taking off or landing at a control tower airport, then um, ATC has uh, certain obligations to give us weight turbulence separation, and they do it based on this, the size difference between the two aircraft. So let's just say, for example, you were cleared to take off behind a uh, Gulfstream which would be a corporate jet, then they may be obligated to give you a two-minute weight turbulence separation before they allowed you to take off, or they may give you uh, three miles behind that aircraft if you were coming in to land behind it. And then if you were going to take off or land behind, say, a C-17, they may be obligated to give you a five-minute separation before you took off behind that aircraft, or it might be five-mile separation in the air. I'm not really sure the exact numbers, but it, it, it works something similar to that. And now what happens when you take off at an uncontrolled tower airport and you're left to use your own judgment on that weight turbulence? Um, you again need to consider the size of the aircraft and imagine where that aircraft's wingtip vortices are going to uh, settle down. Um, 
And when in doubt, certainly give yourself more distance or more time between that takeoff and landing distance behind the aircraft. 